say thank you to Munya. She's been doing a wonderful job introducing people and making us look really good, <laughs> or me anyway. Um, I'm Cindy. It's nice to meet you. I'm also the program curator of the Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Track at Digility. Did you learn something today about AI or machine learning or deep learning? Yes? Yes? Who raised, raise your hands. Who learned something? I learned something today. I did not know that Intel was using AI in order to fix the cracks in the Great Wall of China. That was like super cool, like, right, AI, in order to do it. Next to me and is Patrick, and Patrick came last year to Digility, and I'm just say welcome back to Cologne, thank and you. thank you so much, and he's the one that's on the advisory board for Digility, and you've been so much fun, you know, getting to know you and, and working with you and, and figuring out what stories we wanted to tell and who we wanted to bring on board here. It's been here. a great year putting this together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so when we were talking about, you know, what do, we, what do you want to talk about and whatever, um, you decided to go out and just say that, why the next big leap in AI will have nothing to do with deep learning. How exactly. is that possible? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, so, um, yeah, this, this was sort of a, you know, half-baked kind of talk that I had, and so that's why it's, it's good for us just to have yeah. it in sort of the, the conversational, um, you know, format, I think, especially because uh, we're also now right after lunch, and uh, after lunch is probably the worst time to have a talk about artificial intelligence and quantum mechanics. Um, but you guys are here, so, so I guess you're ready to hear about this stuff. Um, and we're going to try to make it as, as interesting as possible. Right, and I'm going to raise my hand if I didn't understand You're going to raise your hand because or Because I'm can, not going to be the only person interrupt. not understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not rocket science, so you know, I don't understand that unless it's rocket true. science. <laughs> That's true. That's um, true. So, you know, we, yeah. we've been hearing a lot about AI, and mostly when we hear people at Intel and NVIDIA and these other places talking about, you know, the AI algorithms that are doing all the great stuff that you see today, uh, they're talking about these deep learning algorithms, which are... Um, Basically, complex configurations of neural networks. Neural networks have been around for a long time, but in the last 10 years, they really figured out uh, some ways to put really big networks together and make it all work. Uh, and that's why we're seeing a lot of the progress that we're seeing in, in deep learning right now. Um, I kind of um, got into this stuff around 2011, 2012, when I started reading some papers of colleagues who were doing things in deep learning. And I was like, I bet this is going to be the next big thing. And so we started the, the company that I'm at now, Loop AI Labs. And um, so Valley. that was a, basically a format that we were going to use to kind of pursue doing this deep learning stuff and, and seeing what we could do with it. Um, and so now everybody's doing deep learning. You can go to the NVIDIA website and download their stuff and use their GPUs or go to the Intel site and um, you know, download things. And um, you know, we're, we're seeing lots of progress, but you know, a question you can ask is, is this all there is? Right. Like, like we, we have really amazing things happening in AI, mm -hmm. but we still don't have some of the, like, stuff that we see in sci-fi, you know, conversational right. robots, the, the her type of thing, right. or, or the TV show Humans, or HAL 9000, or, you know, any of that right. kind of stuff. Our AI is playing Go in, in Civilization, that's about right, it. Right, right, it's and really good at sort of like limited yeah. tasks, right? Yeah. Uh, and so those tasks might be game playing or something, but when it comes to sort of conversing with a human or sort of mm -hmm. understanding the world in the way that a human understands the world, um, we, you know, we, we just know that it's not there yet. All you got to mm -hmm. do is like chat with a chatbot right. for two minutes and you're like, ah, it's, it's a chatbot. I'm tired There's not a real intelligence bots. on the other side. Please of stop the marketing calls, you know, always like around right. the same time. I'm like, I'm in Germany. Please don't call me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I know. I don't know this number. Yes. Yeah. Do we need another bot? <laughs> so, so one of the things I've been thinking about is, um, you know, what's, what is going to be the next big thing in AI, and what, what do we have to do? Is it going to be like we just haven't found the right configuration of neural networks and deep learning yet, uh, and some, one of these days we're going to just hit on that by messing around with architectures and you know, come up with that AI that's going to be that? I think a lot of people are assuming that that's the case, uh, and I'm here to explain why I think that that's not the case, and there's actually going to be another big leap that's going to happen over the next 10 years in AI. And it has very little to do with deep learning. Mm -hmm. and it actually has a lot more to do with uh, what we think of as quantum mechanics, but really the math of quantum mm -hmm. mechanics, which is quantum probability theory. Right. Um, so 
Show us what Before you got. Before we get into the quantum mechanics stuff, though, I thought we'd just watch a little Star Trek. Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Remember that. Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Oh, wait. Can we Listen rewind this? this or start carefully, over Norman. Point? Yeah, and turn down the, the lights. So can you turn that down? Can we rewind and lying. turn down the lights? You... And as they're getting that done, Star Trek, which is really cool. Anybody know this episode? Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Remember that. We got one Star Trek Harry fan. Tells you is a lie. Listen to this carefully, Norman. I am... Lying. You say you are lying, but if everything you say is a lie, then you are telling the truth. But you cannot tell the truth because everything you say is a lie. But you lie, you tell the truth, but you cannot, for you lie. Illogical. Illogical. Please explain. You are human. Only humans can explain their behavior. Please explain. I am not programmed to respond in that area. That's some great acting. Yeah. How did you know that was? How did you know that was me when I'm trying to code Python? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So in case you missed miss the beginning, Kirk says, uh, uh, "Listen to me. Everything Harry tells you is a lie." And then Harry says, "I'm lying." Uh, and then smoke keeps coming out of his ears because he can't compute the contradiction can't there. Compute. Um, so, so I picked this out because this is actually a scene that we see in science fiction over and over and over again when we're talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, and that's the, the whole idea, the sort of trope that uh, humans will be able to outsmart computers, even an AI, artificially intelligent robot or something like that, because computers are boiled down to logical programming, and therefore computers have to work within this domain of logic, and all humans have to do is come at them with some kind of logical paradox, and then smoke's going to start coming out of their ears, and we'll be able to beat the machine with, with you know, human ingenuity. No. You had a comment? No. Oh. That was like me, right? <laughs> I read right, the light, the light bulb. Right. Um, so, so um, you know, some people might argue like current AI systems are not, you know, programmed in this sort of hard-coded logic like they assumed maybe they would be in the 1960s. Um, they, you know, usually produce some kind of probability distribution which allows for some kind of uncertainty. Um, but we're still usually putting those probabilistic sort of uh, nodes into, you know, some kind of pre-programmed sort of logical system. Uh, and even the, you know, sort of underlying uh, representation of, like, let's say a neural network that learns to recognize cats has some kind of logical structure to it underneath it, even if we can't really view what the structure is. Mm -hmm. um, so, so in a situation like this, you, you know, you might think, all right, so, so robots are logical. We, we, we often think of there being this kind of contrast between, between like, uh, okay, you have computers that are logical and then you have humans that are illogical. And they're, they're usually presented as being a contrastive type of thing, like you've got Kirk versus Spock. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would argue that, that it's not really a matter of these being two different contrasts, uh -huh. uh, but rather one system sort of subsuming the other system. Because we'll see in the next video that Kirk is actually pretty good at logic. He's able to do logic pretty well, and he's able to beat another computer. I just am no man. Logic I game. am perfect. That which is imperfect must be sterilized. You are in error. You did not discover your mistake. You have made two errors. You are flawed and imperfect. And you have not corrected by sterilization. You have made three errors. Error. 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 Examine. You are flawed and imperfect. Execute your prime function. I shall analyze error. Analyze error. I hope the chief data scientist who, who did that is not gamefully employed right now in 2019, <laughs> 2018. You know what I mean? <laughs> he did what? I saw, yo, that's not our chief scientist, you know, data scientist doing that. That's just not. Right. Um, that's not where our AI is going. <laughs> no, I, I love the one scene in there where they, yeah. they like, it, as soon as Kirk starts like throwing the loop at it and then they cut mm -hmm. back to the robot that doesn't have eyes, but you can see it just sort of right. blinking at him, you know, with its like expressionless face. Reactionary. Um, but anyway, the, the, the point of this video is, you know, it's another case of humans outsmart the, the robots. Uh, but in this case, 
He's able to do it sort of using logic, but also able to step outside of logic and use that logic, you know, mm -hmm. against the robot's own sort of interpretation mm -hmm. of things. Um, so, so to me, this, this shows us that um, humans are not necessarily illogical or irrational. Right. Like we're able to do logic, but then we have all this stuff that we can do outside of it. So the, the sphere of human capability, if logic is a sphere like this, the sphere of human capability is a sphere surrounding that sphere. And so we're really what you might call like super logical. Okay. Right? Um, so then the question is, if we are super logical, right. um, what is a framework for that super logical system right. that and human rationality works by? And how beyond, can we get there? Right? Yeah. yeah. And how would we mathematically formalize that and operationalize it so that we could train, mm -hmm. you know, artificially intelligent models to think like Captain Kirk huh. instead of thinking like the poor robots that right. are are, you know, have that logical Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. Um so there have been a lot of people sort of working uh, over for, for a long time on, you know, this problem of, all right, if we have computers that um, need to be able to work with uncertainty. Okay. Uh, there was a guy for, uh, actually, he's still around. I just saw him at Stanford uh, a couple of months ago, yeah. uh, Carl Hewitt, who was at MIT for a long time, did a lot of work on something called inconsistency robustness. And um, inconsistency robustness was just about like, all right, we need to have these, uh, you know, artificially intelligent systems that are probably going to be getting contradictory information, like, you know, everything Harry says is a lie, and listen to me, I'm lying, that sort of thing. And you don't want to have the system just explode whenever it receives these kinds of inconsistencies. Um, so Hewitt has a whole um, uh, sort of development of higher order logic mm -hmm. as opposed to first order logic. Right that uh, incorporates right. this inconsistency robustness. So what's the difference between a higher order logic versus a first order? Well, first order logic is, you know, your, your standard kind of Boolean logic, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. um, and there, we could talk for a long time about, you know, what higher order mm -hmm. logics really mean, and mm -hmm. I don't want to go into that too much because we're going to jump now into oh. a framework of logic uh, okay. that is used in, in quantum mechanics. Okay. Um, that I think is actually the, the perfect generalization of um, perfect. The, the kind of classical right, logic. Right, buckling my seatbelt. Yeah. Um, so so I, you know, I came from psychology, and for a while I was working in um, what's called survey research. So mm -hmm. you give people uh, surveys, and you want to ask people things like, um, uh, you know, so they used to think you just give people questions and people have answers to the questions and they give you the answers and then you use that to, you know, figure out what data you need, whatever you're trying to learn from that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but pretty soon, like in the 60s and 70s, they started to figure out that uh, the way you ask those questions and the order that you ask those questions in can actually have a lot of effect on the answers that people give you. So, for example, if I ask you, mm -hmm. how satisfied are you with your life? and you might give me some certain kind of answer. And then if I say, how satisfied are you with your marriage, you might give me another kind of answer. Mm -hmm. But if I reverse those questions and I say, how satisfied are you with your marriage, and then I say, how satisfied are you with your mm -hmm. life, believe it or not, most people are going to give much lower scores on the life answer after mm -hmm. you've asked them the marriage question. Yeah. Right? That's a trigger. So, so <laughs> but why is that? So, so psychologists have been for several decades now trying to figure out what is the cause of these order effects? You know, mm. how can we make up for them in surveys and stuff like that? It, it makes a difference too in how you code as well, right? In a set of series and going there? Well, I mean, if you're, if you're coding something in a, um, you know, in a, in a sort of logical order. Right. Yeah, I guess, you know, you're, you're using first-order logic for, for coding. Right. Um, but for things like, you know, trying to get answers from people on surveys right. about real-world right. stuff, right. suddenly this other, order matters. this other kind right. of logic comes into play. Yeah. And so people have been trying to figure out, you know, what is, what is the logic there. Okay. Um, so uh, some interesting experiments have been done where they actually gave people surveys and looked at it from a quantum mechanical perspective. Um, so in this particular survey, they, they had some questions like, um, I think this was during like the, the Clinton-Gore election okay. uh, time. And they said, um, they would ask two, two questions. And the first one would be, 
um, you know, to what extent do you think uh, uh, Bill Clinton is honest and trustworthy? And then to what extent do you think Al Gore is honest and trustworthy? And they found that you would get much higher ratings for both of them if you put Al Gore first rather than putting Bill Clinton first. Huh. Um, so it's very much like sort of the, you know, putting your marriage first or your life satisfaction right. first. Um, you can think of it, and people often explain it this way, as it's putting you in a certain frame of mind. You know, yeah. When people are asking you about your life after about your marriage, you're now in this frame of mind of thinking about your life more in terms of your marriage. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so, so what's interesting is in quantum mechanics, um, so in, in sort of regular logic, A plus B equals B plus A, right? Yeah. And A times B equals B times A, yeah. right? However, in quantum mechanics, because you're not using points in space, you're actually using subspaces, yep. and you're using linear, linear algebra yep. to multiply those subspaces. A times B does not equal B times A. All right? So there's an operational way to, well, when I say A times B, I mean taking a tensor product okay. of A and B. There you um, go. Which is not going to be the same as the tensor product of B and A. Okay. Um, so in sense. quantum mechanics, um, the reason that you often get these kinds of effects is because you're choosing a certain frame of reference mm -hmm. in the same way that you would cha yep. choose a frame of reference for, um, you know, whether you're thinking about your marriage first or right. you're, you're thinking about your life first. Um, so what these graphs show, it's, it's kind of hard to figure it out, but I pulled it from a paper here, is uh, in the first case, you're getting um, sort of the, the Gore frame of reference first. Uh, no, sorry, you're getting the, the Clinton frame of reference, which is plain C, and then you're projecting your answer about what you think about Al Gore onto your sort of uh, Clinton space. And in the second case, you're reversing those. Um, now, the, the thing that's kind of hard to make out here, because we're looking at a, at a two-dimensional chart, but the way this is happening is you have what are called basis vectors in, in linear algebra, and basis vectors are just the axes on a graph. You know, you've got like an XY graph, so mm -hmm. the the x-axis is a basis vector and the y. Mm -hmm. um, but if you think about taking that graph and turning it, mm -hmm. you might now have like x prime and y prime. Right. You're changing the basis vector, sure. and that's also changing the perspective that you're looking at all right. of the points that would be, be in that area. Right. Um, so this is how uh, the, w these effects sort of work in, in quantum mechanics, uh, where you can do weird things like have two incompatible perspectives mm -hmm. on the same event, mm -hmm. and yet those perspectives can still coexist. Right. There's an inconsistency there, but they're able to exist within the same framework. Right. And it's only when you take a measurement and you say, OK, I want to know about such and such that you now have to choose a frame of reference. Okay, You have to choose the basis vectors that you're going to use to interpret that measurement. Um, and from that, you're then able to say, OK, here's the answer but we had to choose a frame of reference to get there. Does that so make sense? Are you predicting elections, future elections? Is that what we're working on now? Well, that's, that's perhaps one of the things that we could do. Mm, um, interesting times but, and use cases. But more interesting might be to ask people all kinds of questions in different orders yeah. and see if you can manipulate people's opinions just by changing the way that they're thinking about things. This is so provocative. Which I think is something that we do all the time anyway, mm -hmm. especially in Silicon Valley. Yeah, this um, is so provocative. So, yeah. so the reason that, that this would be significant for, mm -hmm. for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. is um, the one area that artificial intelligence still has not made very many inroads is in the area of, of pragmatics. Um, and pragmatics is just sort of like, you know, what does any sentence or word mm -hmm. or gesture or whatever mean within the particular context that it's happening, right? Um, you know, the interesting thing, we talk a lot here about virtual reality and mixed reality is that you're able to actually change mm -hmm. the physical context yep. that people are you know, perceiving right. the world in. Um, and that makes it a really good sort of test platform for, sure. for AI systems that uh, you want to use to mess around with, with pragmatics. So, We've got a little cartoon here where you know, one guy says, uh, tell the men to move out. Uh, another guy says, why, sir? And then the other guy says, the rents are too high. Right? So it's a little play on word that he's telling the men to move out, like to retreat. But move out could also mean move out of your apartment. Right. Uh, so the, the, the way that we might interpret this in terms of pragmatics and in terms of sort of the quantum probability theory of ma mathematics is that 
the first guy who's talking has chosen a particular set of basis vectors by which he means to communicate a message. Uh, and then this other guy who says the rents are too high, he's in a completely different set of basis vectors, okay? Um, so this is the kind of thing that whenever we get annoyed with computers, it's because computers don't understand sort of the pragmatics of the situation sure. or the basis vectors that we've chosen to interpret, you know, a certain situation in. So here's a spin. What yeah. if you're Chinese and you read right to left? That changes the whole order too in how you're asking your questions. If you read, oh yeah, if you right? say the rents are too high, why it's, sir? Right. Tell the men to move out. Yeah, that's a good question. Right? <laughs> cool, huh? It depends on how you read too. Right? Which, or Arabic, you or, read right to left. Or even if you're, you know, I mean, to, to move out, it's, it's an idiom in, in American English, English yeah. in, and, Maybe. you know, if you're, if you're German, I don't know what the idioms are here. Um, There's a so, German word for it, for sure, I'm pretty yeah, sure. Yeah. There's I a think, German word for everything. I think we're about are out we of about time, time on this one. I was going to go into another little pragmatics thing, but uh, yeah. if you want, we can, we can open it up to questions. Anybody have any questions you want to ask Patrick about quantum mechanics or artificial intelligence? Anything? Anyone? Anyone? All right, why don't you show us this? Because you can't just put something up there. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's human to question so the, what this the is, curiosity, This is just another right? sort of example of, yeah. of pragmatics is uh, there's, there's a Stanford linguist named Herb Clark who um, has a lot of really great examples of like mm -hmm. uh, pragmatic situations um, and, you know, sort of countering existing theories of semantics by throwing in, you know, well, here's something that happens in pragmatics that uh, you know a particular semantic theory can't really explain um, and so one is you know you might think you know what the word teapot is right. and it's generally a noun and it's generally not used as a verb and even if someone's using teapot as a noun in a somewhat creative way uh, you might say like you know like maybe it's an exercise and they say do a teapot or something but you kind of know what that means but if you suddenly encounter teapotted as a verb and somebody says to somebody else, yesterday Max went too far and teapotted a policeman. Um, it's not something that is totally out of the question as having a semantic you know, interpretation within a particular context. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be that your friend Max actually makes teapots and uh, you know, ah. made a teapot of a policeman the other day and for some reason you were a little outraged that, that Max did that. Is there um, a colloquialism for teapotted in English English? No. No. There's no colloquialism for it. And, okay. and, and the, the, the point of this example is to really counter the sort of reductive theories of semantics that say, well, a word has like, you know, maybe seven different types of meanings. Right. And you have a lexicon where you just go in and you pick out one of those meanings and right. then the sentence makes right. sense to you because you right. put all the those things together. An explanation like that yeah. has no way to interpret a sentence like this. Right. And yet we know it's a perfectly feasible sentence. We have one question over there front and center. Um, yes, I wanted to ask how you envision the next step into quantum mechanics if not through deep learning because how I envision it is that um, if you want to train an AI to be able to um, react to any kind of situation no matter the context or the, the pragmatics, um, how we humans do it basically is also through deep learning, right? Because we learn from the culture, from the, our surroundings. How do you envision the step that you could train an AI into that field? Right, so I think that's a good question. We could still, you know, in the future, we would still be using things like reinforcement learning, uh, you, know, um, you know, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, all, all that. Um, the, the real question here is, what is the underlying framework going to be? Right now, like, you know, we go and we listen to talks by Intel and NVIDIA, and they're showing us, oh, we can do, you know, floating points, 16-bit uh, floating points at this uh, speed, you know, and, and train a network, you mm -hmm. know, faster than Intel can do. But they're all talking about the real number scale, right? You're, neg you're, you're going from negative infinity to positive infinity. And if you're using 32-bit floating points or 16-bit floating points, you're going to cut your precision off at some point. Well, what I hate to tell you is that in order to really do quantum mechanics, we can't only use the real number line. We also have to use complex numbers. Uh, so now we're going to have infinity times infinity because you need to also have the complex number scale. Um, so they're going to have to go back to the drawing board and rethink this stuff. Uh, or, probably more likely, 
quantum, quantum computers will be able to solve these problems for us in, uh, in ways that are very different from, from what's going on uh, right now on GPUs, but probably not too different. I, I think you're right that you know, the, the general ideas of you know, training a neural network using reinforcement learning, that type of thing, will probably still be in play. Uh, but instead of having sort of a real valued first order logic based type of learning you know, representation, we have a quantum representation instead. So we're going to wrap up now. You've got a panel that you're moderating tomorrow. Tomorrow. Two tomorrow. of them, actually. Two of them. Well, one, Two. one fireside chat and one, one right. panel, both and on the, AI. And so. you'll be around, walking around. So if anybody has any questions that they want to ask, they'll do it for you. And that's it. Sounds great. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you all.